dozen SS guards wielding whips and rifles with bayonets led the women to the building. They sent 750 people to each gas chamber. The women who tried to resist were stabbed and cut until the blood covered the floor. Eventually, they were all forced into the chambers. I heard the doors closing, heard screams and cries as well as desperate pleas for help in Polish and Yiddish. The moans of women and children chilled my blood, and soon they became a single, horrifying scream. This continued for a quarter of an hour while the chamber's engine ran for 20 minutes. And then, there was silence. What you just heard are the words of Rudolf Reder, a Holocaust survivor who was imprisoned in the Belzec concentration camp. He is a man who had the misfortune of witnessing the operation of a gas chamber firsthand, making him a privileged witness to those years of horror. Both Belzec and Stutthof were two of the most atrocious extermination centers of the Third Reich, although they are not as well known today. Today, in this new episode, we will tell you about the suffering of the prisoners there. Struthof was the first concentration camp that the Nazis opened outside of Germany during World War II. It was located in Poland, in a region of forests and swamps, away from major cities. It was a quiet and low-traffic site, ideal for the leaders of the Third Reich to unleash their sadism. Stutthof opened its doors in September 1939 and was used to house prisoners from the Polish elite. The inmates were religious leaders, prominent politicians and prestigious intellectuals, important members of society who had to be eliminated for the Germans to impose a new order in Poland. Over time, the camp's population grew as the war progressed, and the Nazis took more prisoners. Moreover, there were increasingly more Jews as they were deported there from other parts of the Third Reich. It is estimated that between 1939 and 1945, about 110,000 people passed through Stutthof. More than half died from malnutrition or diseases such as typhus. Guards, upon seeing an inmate too weak to move, showed no mercy and sent them to die in the small gas chamber. Sometimes they were killed with phenol injections. However, there were occasions when the SS had no patience for these methods of execution and resorted to more brutal forms. These included severe beatings with sticks or pushing a prisoner to the ground and holding their head in the mud until they died of suffocation. Those who entered Stutthof had the certainty that they would die. This is what Ziggy Shipper, one of the survivors of this extermination camp, recounts. I never, never accept Stutthof, thought that I was going to die. You saw people in front of you, all over you, dying. But I never thought I was going to die, except Stutthof. When the Nuremberg trials were held, where the crimes committed by Nazis and were judged, one witness said something that chilled the tribunal's blood. According to his statements, in Stutthof, the fat from the corpses was used to make soap. Supposedly, this was done through a chilling process that involved boiling the bodies to harvest them. Although it was never proven to be entirely true, there were indications that the bones of the dead were extracted to create anatomical models for the study of the human body for scientific purposes. The sinister legend of soaps made from Jews continues to this day. However, the horror surrounding Stutthof is also related to the actions of its female guards, Considered the cruelest in the Nazi concentration camps, one of them was Jenny Barkman, who enjoyed implementing new torture techniques to destroy the lives of the prisoners. Her favorite involved whipping the inmates with a leather whip, causing cuts so deep that they could barely stand. Eventually, they lost so much blood that they would faint and die. Sometimes, when she wanted to play with her prey, she whipped them on the heels, causing them to fall to the ground. The victims were immobilized, unable to move their feet but ready for a second round of floggings by Jenny Barkman. Perhaps the most violent thing she did was keep a group of hungry dogs trained to attack prisoners at her command. When someone displeased her, she released the dogs on them which proceeded to open their jaws and tear the flesh into bloody pieces. It is important to note that the camp's high command rewarded cruelty. The guards were encouraged to commit such sadistic acts so that no prisoner dared to cross the line. Next, 
we will see the testimony of Manfred Goldberg, a Stutthof survivor, who recounts how those who broke the rules were punished. They had erected an enormous gallows with eight nooses hanging down, and one by one we had to watch these men, innocent men, being hanged. Another of the most hated guards in Stutov was Herta Bothe, who, following Barkman's lead, used to whip the prisoners. Unlike her counterpart, she had no patience for prolonged torture. She was much more direct. When she lost her temper, she simply drew her pistol and shot the inmates. While the victim bled on the ground, she ordered the other shocked and astonished onlookers to carry the body to the depot. She barely needed an excuse to unleash her fury and kill someone. Let's hear the testimony of Wilhelm Grunwald, a 17-year-old Czech youth who had the misfortune of witnessing the exact moment the guard lost control. I saw some very weak inmates carrying a food container from the kitchen to the barracks. As it was full and heavy, the women put it on the ground to rest. Then I saw Botha shoot the two prisoners with her pistol. On May 9, 1945, Stutthof became the last concentration camp to be liberated by the Allies. Although Jenny Barkman tried to escape, she was captured, tried, and sentenced to death. On July 4, 1946, before the expectant gaze of 200 people, she was executed by hanging. Herta Bothe, on the other hand, was accused of mistreating and murdering prisoners, although she made every effort to deny everything. The jury considered that the accusations lacked the necessary strength to condemn her to death, so they only sentenced her to 10 years in prison. However, she was released earlier, in 1951, and lived the rest of her days keeping a low profile. She finally died in 2000, at the age of 79. Here you can see a snippet of the last interview they conducted with her, recorded in the 1990s but published in 2009. In it, she showed no remorse for her crimes. Der Fehler ist schon, dass ich das Konzept war, aber ich musste hier rein, sonst wäre ich selber reingekommen. Das war mein Fehler. In einer Hinsicht. Now let's see how Belzic, the other concentration camp we will cover today, operated. At the end of November 1941, in the southeast of Warsaw, the construction of Belzec began. From the beginning, it was conceived as an extermination center, a place where the primary goal was to end the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, quickly. The first ones in charge of building the facility were Polish workers, although Jews in conditions of slavery were later used. In February 1942, when the facilities were already completed, the Nazis decided to test the operation of the gas chambers. Their cynicism was such that they used Jewish workers as guinea pigs for this purpose. They poisoned them with bottled carbon monoxide, which was the method used until then in gas vans when gas chambers and the lethal Zyklon B gas did not exist. Almost everything we know about Belzec is thanks to Rudolf Reeder, one of the two people who survived this hell. Yes, you heard right. Of the thousands of men and women who were imprisoned here, only two came out alive. Rudolf Reder was born in Poland in 1881. He managed a soap factory until, during the Nazi occupation of his country, he was sent to the Belzec camp solely because he was Jewish. It was the year 1942, and he was 61 years old. Normally, a sexagenarian like him would have been executed immediately, but he was saved because of his good physical condition and because he spoke German. For these reasons, he was assigned to the Sonderkommandos, units composed of prisoners forced to collaborate with their captors. In this case, Raider's job was to perform maintenance tasks in the gas chambers and to bury bodies. That was how he experienced horror firsthand. 
Let's listen to an excerpt from his memoirs, where he recalls the harsh experience of disposing of the remains of the guest. We dug the pits, the enormous mass graves, and dragged the corpses. In addition to this, the death squad's task was to throw the bodies out of the chambers, throw them into a large pile and then drag them from there to the pits. The ground was sandy, so two workers were needed to drag a corpse. We put leather straps over the arms of the dead and pulled. The heads often got stuck in the sand. We were ordered to throw the bodies of small children over our shoulders two at a time and take them away that way. We stopped digging graves when we dragged bodies. While we did this, we knew that thousands of our brothers were suffocating in the chambers. As you heard, there was no mercy even for children. This is confirmed by a different testimony from someone who was a boy at the time. He was not imprisoned in Belzec, but he had an aunt who worked nearby and witnessed the Nazis' crimes. Jak opowiadała moja ciotka, bo ona pracowała na stacji w bufecie kolejowym, przy, przy tych transportach to nie wolno było podać nawet wyżki wody, a dzieci <śmiech> odlizywały tam te rosy z tych drutów ukratowanych okien. To pewnego razu pytała się tego esesmana, czy można podać wody. To pozwolił. Był taki przypadek. No niektóry wyskakiwał, wyskakiwali z tego wagonu i biegli tam do tych studni. To zostali zastrzeleni. However, there was something worse than dealing with the bodies, and that was seeing how other inmates were killed with poisonous gas. Children were torn from their mother's arms, the sick were put on stretchers, and adults were taken with rifle butt strokes. In the case of female prisoners, their hair was shaved before they were killed. This is how Redder remembers that moment. My heart broke each time. I couldn't bear what I saw. The group of shaved women was led forward, and others stepped on the hair of different colors that covered the entire barracks floor, like a thick plush carpet. 750 people entered each chamber. By the time the six chambers were filled, the people in the first one had been suffering for about two hours. Only when all six chambers were so crowded with people that it was difficult to close the doors would the engine be started. That was when the poison flooded the space and amid screams, the Jews fell to the ground unable to breathe. One of the big questions about this period is how these places could function without anyone being aware of the massacres. Let's look at the testimony of a couple of farmers who lived near Belzec and speak about their suspicions. <laughs> Początkowo tak się domyślaliśmy, a później to, to się potwierdziło. Jak się potwierdziło? No potwierdziło się, że oni to jednak, czy gazem obojętni, czy zabijali, ale likwidowali. No bo gdzieś cztery transporty dziennie. Experts estimate that during the first two months of Belzec's operation, about 93,000 people perished. The surroundings of the camp were made up of the massive graves that the Sonderkommandos, like Rudolf Rieder, dug. An unsuspecting person walking there would be, unknowingly, stepping on a subsurface made of bodies. In fact, when the corpses decomposed, they released the accumulated gas, making the camp's air almost unbreathable due to its toxicity level. This led to the Nazis mounting a gruesome operation to clean Belzec's environment in October 1942. For this, they exhumed the bodies and burned them in outdoor ovens. At the same time, this served to erase the traces of their crimes. 
The smoke from the chimneys dyed the sky black, generating a macabre vision that combined cruelty and impunity. In November 1942, a month after the operation, Redder managed to escape by boarding a train that left in search of provisions. Sheltered in darkness, he managed to leave hell without being detected. At the end of the Second World War, he testified at the trials held in Krakow against the Nazi leaders who administered Poland during the occupation. In the same year, he published a memoir detailing his experiences in the concentration camp, and it is thanks to this that we know what happened there. All other evidence of Belzik's crimes has been lost because the Nazis dismantled the site around 1944. The other survivor of Belzek was a Polish man named Chaim Herzman. His family was executed in the camp, although he managed to escape in June 1943. In 1946, when he was going to present his testimony to recount his experiences in the extermination center, he was killed in his apartment by an anti-communist militia, taking his story to the grave. Today, Belzec and Stutthof are remembered as two of the most aberrant camps of the Third Reich. Hundreds of thousands of people passed through their gates, suffered, and died. Nowadays, there are monuments erected there to honor the victims and prevent their pain from being forgotten. We have reached the end of the video. Leave your comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history.